Good morning. How are y'all doing? I'd like to now enter into our formal church uh, service by asking uh, our Dakota to come forward and lead us in our opening prayer. And I invite you to stand as you are able as we share this and remain standing for the song of welcome. Good morning. And welcome to all of you who are joining us from your place of worship. As we gather together on this third Sunday after Easter, let us rejoice and give gratitude to God. We have gone from the tragedy of the cross to an empty tomb. And that empty tomb has given us the gift of hope and salvation and everlasting life. Would you join me in the spirit of prayer? God on high, give us hearts full of gratitude. We have much to celebrate, and we ask that you would fill our souls with a pure desire to worship. The gift you have given us in the raising of your son from the dead is worthy of all your glory and honor and praise. We want our worship to reflect the elation we feel. Thank you for being present with us. Guide us as we worship today. Amen. And please remain standing. We are going to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Shall 
Lectionary, as most of you know by now, is a book that arranges readings from the Bible in a certain order. The lectionary that we currently use is organized into a three-year cycle, uh, years A, B, and C. And the readings mostly follow the chronology of, life, of Christ's life from Advent through Easter, the lead up to Pentecost, and then the letters of Paul and other writings featured. The three synoptic Gospels, the ones that kind of agree in, uh, with each other, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are featured in these years. The Gospel of Matthew is generally assigned to year A, Mark is year B, and Luke is year C. John is read throughout Easter and highlights other liturgical seasons, such as Advent, Christmas, and Lent. We are currently in year B, which is Mark's year. However, there are exceptions throughout the year, and these last two weeks were exceptions to Mark. He got two weeks off. The week after Easter in the lectionary has traditionally been given over to the story of Thomas, who missed the first appearance of Jesus in the upper room, but is present for the second. Pastor Leanne shared John's story about that in her online sermon last week. Today you will hear Luke's story of the same event, although Thomas isn't specifically mentioned. Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, of which there are many, takes us to the upper room twice. In truth, the Gospels, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus has been revealing himself a lot since his resurrection. Depending on which scholar's timeline you are using, there are at least five times that he's been seen and had conversations with people all on that first Sunday alone. Mark and John tell us of his encounter with Mary Magdalene at the tomb alone that first morning. Matthew's story is of the three women who see him that morning and fall at his feet. Mark and Luke both note the encounter with the two men on the road that afternoon. And Luke and Paul both talk about a private encounter with Peter, also in the late afternoon. And finally, Luke and John tell of the disciples gathered in the upper room on that first, and all of this happened on the first Sunday. Goodness, Jesus sounds like a modern pastor's meeting schedule to me. In today's reading, we are in the upper room a week after Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus has two th things on his mind, apparently. The first was this his second confirmation of his bodily resurrection to the disciples gathered there. And here's the invitation to touch his hands and his side and believe. And the second is to reveal the scriptures to the disciples, to show them that his resurrection isn't the end of things, it is only the beginning. Let's listen. Good morning. The scripture for today is Luke chapter 4, verses 36b to 48 in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. 
While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of royal fish and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnessing witnesses of these things. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I would ask as we enter into this time of a sermon that you would pray with me and if you would pray for me. That the words of my mouth and the meditation that is on my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So often when I prepare a sermon, it takes me some time to figure out the lead in. I usually look up stories or quotes and so on to get me going. And sometimes it takes me an hour or so just to get started, maybe longer. This week, however, I quickly got my inspiration and it literally came from the heavens with the eclipse on Monday. Did you see that? How many of you had a chance to view it? Well, Beth, as always, was well prepared and she ordered eclipse glasses to share with her staff at work and she got some extras for me to bring to church. And so last Monday for about 40 minutes, Paula, Joanne, and Ed Simpson who was here as he often is here, cleaning up trash and keeping our facility spruced up. Thank you, Ed. Anyway, those, those three friends and I stood out in Winter's Garden and watched the moon shadow move across the sun's disk. Here in San Diego County, we got about 65% coverage, which made the sun look like a cookie with a huge bite out of it. I was tempted to get a giant oatmeal cookie and give you a demonstration, but I passed on that. For Paula and Joanne, it was the first time to observe this event, and I think it was Joanne who said, that is so cool. We also got to see those half-moon shadows cast on the ground or on a wall when, when the sun is filtered through the leaves of a tree, which I find to be very cool. The first time I saw that phenomenon, I didn't even remember that it was an eclipse day. But when I exited the San Diego State Library after my shift, and walked across the quad, I noticed the distinct crescent-shaped shadows and thought, there must be an eclipse today. For Monday's eclipse, it was also cool to know that my family, Beth at work in Escondido, Tammy with her residence from the care facility that she works for, and Wolf and Bryce on their Whirlwind National Park tour, and happened to be at White Sands, New Mexico, where they got 85% shadow, by the way, it was very cool that my family were all watching this event, not at precisely the same time, but nearly. Son Dan and Washington glanced out at the sky, which was completely overcast, but he dutifully chimed in anyway. We would have had only 18% shadow here anyway. Well, you can't win them all. And within less than an hour, all of us had texted each other with some variation of, did you see that? Beth's experience was at the same time as my little group's was, but with an unexpected teaching moment. A couple of her younger staff members had not only never seen it, but didn't know that it was the moon that was casting the shadow over the earth. So Beth got to reveal the wonders of planetary science to a couple of folks who didn't know what they were seeing. Her first reaction, and mine too, when she told me this was, what are they teaching in science class these days? But then I thought about it, and I realized that for a person who has never been told about how an eclipse works, the idea that our moon is just the right size and just the right distance at 240,000 miles from Earth to fully cover the sun's disk, which lies 93 million miles from Earth, 
and that it is precisely placed to cast a shadow over the earth's surface could easily be unbelievable. And it's a perfectly sized shadow too, that so for a few minutes, day becomes night. When you think about that, it really does sound unbelievable. When you see it now, when you see it for the first time, then it becomes much more believable. And the question, did you see that, gets its answer. Why yes, yes I did. And it all makes much more sense now. It doesn't take much imagination to think that when the disciples on that first Sunday started to tell everyone, guess what we just saw? Jesus came into the room with us, or I saw him in the garden, or he met us on the road outside of town, they were met with skepticism. Certainly we know that Thomas couldn't believe it. I'm fairly certain that when the disciples charged out of the upper room saying, did you see that? They were met with several variations of, I'll believe it when I see it. As Pastor Leanne noted in her online sermon last week, most of us are a lot like Thomas in that. Even as believers, we often need assurance and confirmation. We need that moment of surety that Jesus is indeed risen, not only a long time ago, but in the here and now. Well, as I mentioned, our scripture for today is found both in Luke and John. It takes place a full week after the events of that first Easter morning. Jesus drops in on the disciples who were once more gathered in their usual meeting place. And this time everyone was there. He allowed himself to be seen and to be touched. And eventually he even eats normally in front of them. And all the disciples, Thomas included, have their doubts and fears transformed into confirmation and joy. But what jumped out at me on this reading of Luke wasn't the upper room amazement, although that is there, but I was drawn to what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. After Jesus had eaten the fish and the disciples were convinced of his resurrection yet again, Luke tells us he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures and he said, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what the Father promised. Jesus is calling the disciples to their life's work, their mission, and he is reassuring them that God has promised that God's spirit and wisdom and comfort and strength will be theirs when they need it as they preach and teach and live the good news, witnessing to all the nations. This call echoes the great commission that Matthew shares in his gospel, go ye into all the world and so on. And if you want to have your memory on that fully refreshed, see Beth after class. It's her favorite scripture, and I know this not because she often quotes it constantly, but I see it constantly in the way she lives. Michael Spence, in his book, Mere Christianity, Finding Your Way Back to Jesus-Shaped Spirituality, has written this. The call that resonates most closely in the heart of disciple is follow me. The command to follow requires that we take a daily journey in the company of other students. It demands that we be lifelong learners and that we commit to constant growth in spiritual maturity Discipleship is a call to me, but it is a journey of we. Jesus calls his disciple, Jesus' call to his disciples is also the call to us, to we, my friends. We who are the post-resurrection people and have chosen to be followers of Christ. And as followers, Jesus has laid out before us a life plan. Share the good news. Act in mercy to all you meet. Love one another. Be the disciple that God calls you to be. Is this easy? No. Is it worth it? Yes, and not just to you. It's worth it to those you serve and save and love and comfort. Will it always make you happy? Not always, perhaps. It can be hard work, exhausting work. 
and the results may not be immediate. Will it bring you joy? Oh, most definitely, it will. Here's something that eclipse chasers know. It isn't easy. Hours of travel by car or plane or possibly boarding a ship, fighting traffic. One of Wolf's friends went to the middle of the country and uh, found out that was completely overcast. He had time to run down to the airport and fly to Canada so that he could be in the path of totality. It isn't easy. Then you have the long wait as the world grows dark. However, then there is the sudden transcendent moment of totality in which the sun's corona becomes a ring of fire or looks like a diamond ring, like a, like a diamond in the sky for a few minutes. All of those who are watching are united in a single glorious moment. And I'm willing to bet moments after strangers who had just shared that moment even, the question flies around, wow, did you see that? Did you see that? The disciples had just seen it for real. And in that moment, Jesus sets their hearts on fire for what's next. They saw it. The question for us remains, did you see that? We live in a world that challenges us to see it or to resiliently believe it. The constant barrage of division and hatred makes it hard for us to remain visible or even want to be seen as the good guys. I cannot tell you the number of times I've felt I just want to go away from all this. And so have many of you because you told me about feeling that. Several years ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a team of doctors discovered a 17-year-old boy who had been institutionalized all his life because he never said a word and was considered to be helpless. He was only five when he had been sent to live in the facility. One day a staff worker put out a transistor radio kit on a table the boy came across the kit. Since he'd never learned to read, he followed the diagrams. He assembled the radio and turned it on, and it worked. That finally got the doctor's attention, and they decided that maybe a more thorough test was necessary and discovered that he was merely deaf, and with the aid of hearing devices, he went on to live a successful life. This story is a parable for it shows us just how easy it is to get lost. This young man's deafness and his abilities were both hidden by his actions. Growing up in that institution, he acted the way he thought he was supposed to act, like everyone around him. He took on the characteristics of helplessness, and his genius lay unnoticed even by himself for 17 years. We humans can easily be like that. We often tend to act just like the crowd around us acts, blending in, playing it safe, keeping a low profile. It seems almost to be kind of an evolutionary thing. We adapt to the environment in order to survive. But that speaks, I think, to a struggle going on inside us. There's a part of us that wants to just do only what is necessary to get along, to survive. But there's also the other part of us that longs to be free, that wants to be our true self, a self that aspires to greatness. That side of us enables us, when we allow it, to move beyond mere survival into the heights of human experience. The message of the Christian faith is that we are not yet fully human unless we are free. We are not what God wants us to be until our inner spirit is revealed and we are moved to act in faith and in love. The famous 19th century philosopher Soren Kierkegaard had this to say about our desire to be ordinary. He said, you cannot call yourself a Christian and be content with that part of you that seeks security all the time. And he wrote this statement, when I read the Bible, I get the impression that God expects each one of us to be a giant. We could spend the hours of our days and the days of our years just getting by, just blending into the crowd, just surviving, so that we become blind or invisible. But there is hope and there is strength and there is calling from the master of life for people such as we.
Open up your eyes. Did you see that? 2,000 years ago, Jesus was popping up all over Jerusalem and beyond, showing his followers that he was alive then. And I believe Jesus is still showing up and is alive now, in this very moment, possibly in this very room. God calls us to be giants, especially in the way in which we love one another, speaking the truth in compassion and love and justice. We must trust in Jesus' promise of the Spirit guiding us in it all. And if you believe that, and by your presence here, I think you possibly do, we must answer the call to arise. No matter how scary your life may seem to use, Jesus will tell you again and again, there is life even in the darkest hour. Easter is the fulfillment of that promise. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has written this, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. I know we believe that for every week we share a call to offering and action. Action in our context is just another word for discipleship. This congregation is pretty well known for our outreach and mission. We are living out the call that Jesus has given us. Let me share one more quote. This one is from Mike Stachara, who is president of a foundation that, not surprisingly, is called the Great Commission Foundation. He says, the mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. By that standard, my friends, and I believe by Jesus' standard as well, you can conf with confidence say, we are part of a great congregation. Go confidently now into the world as God's people released and reassured, knowing that the risen Christ and the love of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit goes with you. Amen. Mercy is falling, is falling, is falling. Mercy it falls like a sweet spring rain. Mercy is falling, is falling all over me. Mercy is falling, is falling, is falling. Mercy it falls like a sweet spring rain. Mercy is falling, is falling all over me. I received your mercy, hey oh, I received your grace, hey oh, I will dance forevermore. Hey oh, I received your mercy, hey oh, I received your grace, hey oh, I will dance forevermore. Mercy is falling, is falling, is falling. Mercy, it falls like a sweet spring rain. Mercy is falling, is falling all over me. Mercy is falling, is falling, is falling. Mercy, it falls like a sweet spring rain. Mercy is falling, is falling all over me. Hey, oh, I received your mercy. Hey, oh, I receive your grace, hey oh, I will dance forevermore. Hey oh, I receive your mercy, hey oh, I receive your grace, hey oh, I will dance forevermore. Hey oh, I receive your mercy, hey oh, I receive your grace. I will dance forevermore. Hey, oh, I received your mercy. Hey, oh, I received your grace. Hey, oh, I will dance forevermore.
We enter now into that time as a congregation that we turn our minds and thoughts directly towards God in conversation with God in prayer. So I would ask you, you would join in with me in an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, we turn our thoughts and hearts toward you in hope and in trust. It is sometimes difficult to see the woes of the world all around us and to keep that hope and to walk in that trust. We are often overwhelmed by the continued clamor of the voices of hate and separation, fear-mongering and divisiveness. Help us walk in a different way. Empower us to be voices of reason and healing, inclusiveness and love. Make us mindful of the words we ourselves use with each other and about each other. Help us to appreciate our common ground, to walk in beauty, as our Navajo sisters and brothers put it. We ask you to help us to align our hearts with your heart, our spirits with your Holy Spirit. Guide us, we pray, and help us to understand that you walk with us. That is the part of, of the message of Easter. Let that joy and comfort continue to echo in our being, not for just a few days or weeks, but always, so that when we are seen, it is you that is revealed. We are gratified to be a part of a community of believers. We share each other's joys and pray for each other in need. We are mindful of those in our community to, who need our prayers. We pray for Norm Corwin for a cure for normal pressure hydroencephalus, for Carly Lockman for her health with long-term COVID and traumatic brain injury. Pray for forward progress. We continue to pray for Dick Muir, Jim McLaughlin, Ray Anworth, Janice Myers, Bo Kim, Joanne Brainerd, Joan Brainerd and Joanne Villadetta, Margot and Jim Rogers. All of us are in this together, O oh God, and it is therefore in the spirit of family and care we lift up our prayers. And we really all are part of a family that you have made clear from the creation onward, and most especially in the presence of your Son among us. And so, as we gather in this body, we pray back to you the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
We come now in the service to the time of responding to God's compassion and grace through making an offering. Your offering in response to God's love can be a commitment to do good or to pray for others or to speak kind and encouraging words. Your offering in response to God's word can also be a financial contribution to the ministries of our church. It is through your financial gifts that we are able to provide this worship online and continue doing outreach and ministry. No financial gift is too small. Every dollar that you offer matters as we work to serve God every day and lift up people. Please continue using the QR code to make a contribution or mail in your check or consider making a regular monthly offering. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for this shared ministry that we do together. So if you would join me in our poll, loving creator, we come forward together to present our tithes and offerings. We are reminded of the profound love with which you have called us your children. Help us recognize that our generosity and stewardship of the resources you've entrusted to us are a sign of our commitment to this holy transformation. May these offerings we bring today be a reflection of our love for you and our desire to be faithful stewards of your blessings. Bless our giving and guide us in using these gifts wisely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive now this benediction. Go now knowing that since you've seen it, you have something to say. Go now knowing that your words will come because the Holy Spirit goes with you. Go now and preach the good news in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. <laughs>